Good evening. Uh, welcome to the final day of G5A's Intermedium with uh, A Thousand Guts by Sujata Sethia. This week uh, has been another occasion that's reinforced our belief uh, in honest and bold storytelling. Working with Sujata over the last several months uh, to realize her vision uh, and give these stories their time and energy uh, has really been an eye-opening and uh, enriching experience. So from all of us at G5A, thank you, Sujata. Um, we close the installation with the in essential conversation that we hope is the first of many, many more. Uh, so on that note, uh, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we have Manisha Khosla Sinha, who's a CSR and communications veteran with 20 years of experience, and she currently leads CSR initiatives and brand strategy at BNP Paribas India. We are immensely grateful to Manisha and the whole BNP team uh, for their continued involvement with the work that we do at G5A and also helping us make this possible. Um, Chuck Shubora is the co-founder of Contour Media, a creative agency specializing in organic content marketing and personal branding. Uh, a domestic abuse survivor, she advocates for ethical storytelling and body positivity. Um, Flavia Agnes is a pi pioneering women's rights lawyer and legal scholar, uh, co-founder of Majlis. She has spent over four decades advocating for violent survivors, particularly women and children. Uh, thank you for making the ex exception tonight and joining us here. Um, Ifat Jivan, with a career spanning three decades in fashion and retail, her personal experiences with mental health led her to co-found the Sanctum Foundation, a center focusing on mental health support. And one of their uh, team members is here, uh, if anyone would like to uh, talk to them during, before, after. Not before, but. Um, Sujata Sethya is a multidisciplinary artist. Her work merges traditional artistic interventions with photography, highlighting subaltern histories often overshadowed by cultural imperialism. Her ongoing project, A Thousand Cuts, has received critical acclaim, including being featured in the 2024 Lens Culture Critics' Choice Top 10 and winning the creative category at the Sony World Photography Awards. Uh, thank you all once again uh, for joining us and over to all of you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this conversation. It's a very, very important conversation, but not many speak about it or want to hear about it. So uh, honestly, from the bottom of our hearts, thanks so much. And thank you so much for all the panelists. I thought uh, for a very long time, what is, it the, what is the question that I should open with? And I have many, but I really want to start with a question that I want to open to the entire uh, panel. Often uh, we hear that you have brought it upon yourself. Uh, how, uh, Flavia, ma'am, let's let's just start with you. With so much experience, so much narratives that you hear on a regular basis, have we really brought it upon ourselves? Uh, it's not possible within the existing equations to bring it upon yourself because the social equations are such, marriage equations are such that it always happens to you. You're not the instigator, you're the recipient. But of course, people always ask you, what did you do that it happened to you? You must have done something. So it's very important for the entire society to understand that as a victim who then becomes a survivor, uh, you, you bear that violence, you endure that violence. You try to survive through that violence, but you cannot bring it upon yourself because it is an outcome of a situation that exists externally, external to you. And I find, I still find that question very strange when people ask, but what is it that you did? I said, but I do nothing. I'm just there. Um, and it happens to you. So I find that very, the question very disturbing when people ask you, what did you do? Something you must have done. I mean, I feel like the cultural discourses that have been uh, that have been ongoing for such a long time that are inherently violent towards uh, women. 
what has been your experience if uh, you've had uh, you've had interaction with so many uh, survivors what is the clinching point where she decides or he decides that this is the point where i am not going to take it any uh, more i think um, when it comes to the kids i think that's the tipping point i think when it comes to themselves they're still okay to take it because they somewhere at the back of their mind they still want to make it work right the minute they realize that it's now beginning to affect the kids or the kids are being beaten or you know there are uh, various issues cropping up with the kids i think that's when women actually then get up and want to do something right because that's for a mother i think that's the only thing that matters i mean we are two survivors sitting here who are both children who have uh, who have uh, watched violence while growing up chakshu what what is your thought on uh, does it does it uh, change for uh, the mother when she sees that it is coming on to the child as well and do you want to also share a glimpse of your story so okay so for me i think um, it starts with societal narratives you know as a girl you're always told oh you have to shut up and listen sorry for that but you have to shut up and listen uh, to what a man says especially in indian society and the societal narratives have been coming along for generations to generations to generations like you have to behave a certain way you have to talk a certain way uh, act a certain way and if your opinion is not mattering to the man of your house or to your father of your house then um they kind of go violent you know they want you to listen to them comparatively to what you might have a new idea and in my own story yes i think um my mom she she's here with us today but she got up and she said enough is enough you know what i can go and go on telling stories about how i'm surviving and what is happening to me but that's enough you know what i'm going to make you i'm going to make your decision come alive i'm going to give you the wings to fly fly off and never come back so if she did not have the strength to do that she gave me that the strength she gave me the strength to be courageous to uh break those ceilings to break that societal norms and say to the world that i am me and i don't care if you want to accept me so yes i think it changes to a lot of for a lot of women and nowadays because you can see the what is happening in india as well before in the uh women would like stay quiet uh but now women now stand up and they don't take it. i think after the movie thappar i think that was like the major point that every every woman was like okay you know what it's enough so i think yeah they're changing in but it's still a very slow starting process do you really think flavia ma'am that uh, i i've often been hearing this uh, narrative that oh things are changing now and people are talking very openly about it do you think it's changing and i i i can also see if her shaking her head so yeah <coughs> it's changing quite a lot <coughs> like when i started my journey that was 40 years ago nobody would believe that a woman like me from a middle class english speaking background it could happen to her people say it can't be happening to you we had many stereotypes we still do that it only happens in the slums and there must be a problem of alcoholism does he drink domestic problem of mother in law and if these things are not there then domestic violence is not there forget the uh, emotional abuse even acute physical violence was not recognized and of course the thing is then what did you do how does it happen only to you everywhere so you not only endure the violence but you feel very ashamed about it you feel very guilty about it nobody would believe the police would not believe the judges would not believe the neighbors would not believe the social workers would not believe like being a catholic you go to church or parish priest the priest would not believe nobody would believe and uh, my own autobiographical book on this issue was written just to make people understand what does a woman go through ordinary middle class woman ordinary husband 
just general middle class family raising three children uh, and what does she actually go through on a day to day basis right from what to cook to where the money uh, to the physical violence is physical violence is not only physical violence there's always emotional violence uh, over there issue about control over money uh, the general control of every every possible way and you are shattered i was a very confident person before i got married but then in the marriage you are totally broken you don't know what's right and what's wrong anymore and you lack the ability to express yourself to stand on your own feet and you are always going inwards you, you build a shell around you so that uh, other people don't notice you nobody notices what's happening to you and you become very isolated you don't want to talk about it you don't want to meet people and you just inwards you are basically living inwards so when that happens you cannot fight back unless you break that you cannot fight back because fighting back is a big struggle with yourself first of all and then of course with the whole community so uh, you have to break that you have, have a so- strong support group if it's not your mother then somebody else has to be there very strongly supporting you who was your strong support group i <clears throat> at that time 1980 i joined a women's organization women's movement was just starting and when i i just went for a meeting and then people used to think that i'm some political activist or um some public figure because i could speak well and then i should then i i should tell them i've come because of my own experience initially of course nobody believed you and all that and then uh, what happened was uh, they all said we will support you and there were one or two of them because of whom my life changed if at all you want to uh, leave you can bring your children you can come to my house you can stay there we'll find a way out etc so they were not there were at least three or four women like that and that was my support strength because my mother was a widow and she had five daughters and she could not support me at all in fact she was very ashamed of me that this is happening to me and of course it was she who got me married i'm the only one in my family who had an arranged marriage so she also felt very guilty about it for a long time i didn't tell her also then some relatives and all would see a my hand in a fracture or a mark all on on my body and they would tell her and then she felt very shattered she felt very shattered she didn't know how to support me she didn't know how to come out, uh, uh, be there for me and i didn't have faith in her i didn't think she was able to support me at all so i didn't come out with her support i came out with the external support this and for a long time i felt very bitter towards my mother for getting me married because that marriage was not as per my i i was not i i wanted that marriage i was only 20 but she felt that i was getting too old and i should get married immediately and that's how it all it stopped happened within a month of the marriage that is a very great point you have brought up ma'am about uh, finding uh, your support group but one of the ways in which a perpetrator attacks the victim is emotional isolation and i have heard over and over again uh people who have experienced violence saying the first thing that the perpetrator started doing was to say so many bad things about people who were really close to me that i had to eventually stop interacting with them entirely so how in that where are those touch points this is where i want to bring you in manisha how important it is at that time for corporates to uh, you know we talk a lot about inclusivity and like you put it up on linkedin today that you know it's inclusivity day i believe uh, uh, it uh, uh, yeah Uh, i mean we we talk a lot about inclusivity now going forward uh, and we talk about inclusivity towards gender equality and um, i mean lgbtqai or uh, or gender or uh, neurodiversity where is it that we are talking about inclusivity towards uh, survivors of domestic abuse are are corporates in, uh, sensitized enough to find those initial signs that somebody sitting right next to you perhaps would be going through abuse and how can i extend a helping hand so firstly thanks for having me here um you know before i answer your question i just want to uh, speak on the earlier point where um, you know where we talked about whether this is widely prevalent or not um i'll just give a personal example 
you know even today the fact that i have a lot of agency over my life it's considered oh you're so lucky the fact remains that if i'm not a victim of some kind of abuse and i have agency i'm lucky means uh, it's a lot more there than we see it and it's in all strata of society uh coming back to your question i think um, and i can speak for bnp i have a couple of friends also in the audience who uh, work for other corporates um i think at least with the multinational corporates we are seeing a trend um where there is an intent to tackle this topic um bnp paribas being one of them um one of the things that we've done is um actually have training sessions for senior management to try and spot certain signs so coming back to your question um i had a team member a few years ago uh she'd been married recently and um you know she was a very outgoing gregarious girl and suddenly we you know there was a change in her personality and she was a lot quieter she was she was less outspoken in meetings um more withdrawn um the team outings where she would always be part of um the group and uh, would probably be the life of the gathering was not happening anymore uh frankly speaking initially one thought okay you know a lot of changes happen nothing to to think about but gradually that became more systemic she was spending longer hours in office and so i asked her manager i said you know what's going on is there so much work really and then we delved deep into it and frankly she was being abused at home um newly married girl going through a lot of trauma and at the same time very ashamed of of uh, as as uh, flavia ma'am said you know you come from a certain background and you assume it doesn't happen to me it happens to somebody else hamare yahan to hota nahi hai ye sab um ghar pe hum baat nahi karenge iske bare mein kisi ko batayenge nahi office mein nahi baat karenge and um and then we have an employee health line uh, you know helpline and uh, she used that anonymous helpline and she's taken help so i'm not saying uh, it solves the problem but i think there is at least i would say some slight shift in our attempt to have conversations and create advocacy around this that's great information but uh, i have another follow up question to this uh, as somebody who has grown up witnessing uh, abuse i felt that my uh, mental health condition for the longest time even though i had the talent i had the ability i had the skill sets uh, made me internally physically and emotionally so weak that there were a lot of jobs i knew i was uh, uh i was perfectly perfect for but i couldn't apply for them or i couldn't get through those job interviews because of a lack of self worth so this is what the organization bnp for example is doing at the level of uh a, the system where employees are already inside the system how do you uh, alter the interview system in a way where it is more uh, receptive for people who might be going through abuse and have as a result mental health issues but you know they are perfectly capable of doing the job once they are inside the system okay look i'm not an hr person but i do know uh, you know we have the head of hr for bank of america in the audience and i would want to hand over the mic to her to to ask this can i do that can absolutely. i take the liberty absolutely let let us just keep it as open as possible thanks manisha and hi everyone it's a very important topic and i'm glad that there is conversation happening around it Uh, around covid time we started a helpline uh, you know for covid when people were, uh, were 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 suffering and all that and then the helpline we had the infrastructure and everything and that helpline remained uh, with us we said okay we have the infrastructure what do we do and then it started providing uh, support to staff for uh, you know critical moments in life and one of them was domestic violence and uh, that anybody who has uh, is facing domestic violence can reach out to the helpline and they keeping all the anonymity and everything they'll provide help it's very personal so we can't really or it's very uh, you know it's initial so we really don't go and find out hey has anybody applied to you or has anybody come to you but we do ask that what's happening so there have been a few cases i wouldn't say that there have been none that it's a young population and uh, which is there but um uh what what flavia ma'am was saying you know women will come forth and then they will they'll just withdraw that thinking that uh uh you know it's it's not okay and and uh, I, okay i came to you and i you helped me but please don't share with anybody and i don't want to share about it so i think that stigma which women themselves think there is a there is no stigma what what you were saying that it's something is somebody is doing it to you you are not doing it to yourself so the other person should be ashamed of it not the women regarding interviews you know that's a a very difficult topic to to do that 
uh, how do we find out because uh, the good part is that interviews are focused on uh, uh, you know on the talent of the person not really what they come from the background they come from or what what social strata and what they come from uh, at times it's uh, uh, you know some people may not be very confident so you give them a little time you give them a little assurance and you you make it a little comfortable for them so that they can speak up uh, more importantly when they join the organization i i was telling my manager the uh, you know our team the other day that there are people sitting in the office very late we just took account you know how many people are sitting late why are they sitting so late do they have so much work to do and the manager said not really i said why don't you talk to them so it's more about once people join the organization are there any signs which which they are they, they, which one can pick up why are they staying late why don't uh, uh, you know at times a, a, a person may come w- with some bruise mark and then the bruise mark looks a bit awkward and they'll say oh i fell that day my child pushed me they they are making excuses uh, a bruise mark can happen once but not again and again so that's something which is there and then of course uh, uh you know i would tell the women in the the team that hey you you talk to them on a day to day basis why don't you go and just just take them out for a cup of tea or that person's eyes were looking a little swollen so obviously the person has cried it it looked like that so why don't you go uh, out there it's about being sensitive that that's just about it's about being sensitive we should if we encourage people to bring their whole self to work uh the whole self is not just the professional self it's it's what they are so it's about bringing the whole self to work that's my view um uh, if at i wanted to ask you you would have met uh, spoken with survivors of abuse and then you would have spoken with children who have experienced uh, violence while growing up um how does uh, what is the lasting impact on children and do you think they eventually even when they grow up are able to emotionally and mentally get out of it and what are the um what are the steps that can be taken through the mental health services to help them at least uh, heal so honestly uh, so jata i don't think these things just go away <coughs> takes a lot of work right so uh, especially for kids right uh, these are your growing years your foundation years and if you experience violence uh, you may not stay with the exact feeling but it it does impact your relationships going forward right so every relationship that you build on and while we are only talking about uh abuse through violence i mean i have seen my own kids right so i come my marriage my first marriage had emotional abuse to another level right so i can see that affecting my kids even today right so i can imagine i can just about imagine what vi- you know physical violence does to kids and we work with kids uh, we have we are associated with majlis also as an as an organization and we have little kids coming to us uh it's very hard to get them to even talk about it right so the child does not want to relive anything that is going on at home for them they want to just get away from that space and at that point in time if the parent is not empowered if the mother is not empowered which we find is very very common in the lower social strata of course uh it's not something that the child has the choice about so they have to continue to live in that environment the longer they stay in that environment the longer the effects of it and i think these are things that stay and move on with you in life uh of course today we have help and uh, there's a lot of help available uh, but we've also come across a lot of people who shy away from talking about it right so not everyone wants to address the issue so i may have left it behind physically but i'm still carrying that emotional baggage with me through every phase of life that i move on into right until i'm not going to go out there and ask for help uh it's going to be hard for me so i would say it continues to impact you as long as you are you know going uh, to be around can i just add to that you know to what if it is saying so uh, it, it makes me remember this anecdote back in college we were a group of friends we were all 18 years old wasting our time and having s- silly conversations and one of the conversations a group of girls was having is um, okay so what will it be th- what will be that one thing uh, that you would be willing to uh not break your marriage for none of us even had boyfriends at that point of time but i'm you know this is how silly we were um and actually one of my friends said you know uh yeah. and the conversation veered and she said actually if my husband were to to slap me once in a while i don't think it's a big deal it happens and she was the of, you know daughter of a very senior civil servant uh i found it you know very shocking um but of course 
we left it at that um years later she got married continues to be married um you know uh, it's a functioning marriage i guess um but she's willing to put up with a certain standard of behavior because it's normalized for her so uh you know i think that's the piece we need to understand this happens even in in affluent english speaking sections like ma'am said earlier it's happening everywhere we are we are and we are okay with it yeah i mean you brought a, a great segue here uh, i was just about to come to schools and school education and flavia ma'am and chakshu both i mean uh, chakshu i'll very quickly get to you first uh, you and i both have experienced uh, abuse while growing up uh, one of the things that i realized was that uh, i there is there is one isolation that the society brings upon you and there is one isolation that you bring upon yourself because i had a personal narrative which was so different from rest of the girls in my school i just felt like i couldn't really have strong bonds and whatever bonds that i built were based on a power nexus where i was always seeking their validation so only you know at 42 last year is when i started to slowly chip away from those relationships realizing that now i'm in a position where i can have equal relationships did you also face something like that and also as a survivor uh, and a child in a school uh, were you able to spot signs that there is somebody else sitting perhaps right next to you could have been experiencing the same things because i met with somebody 25 years later recently and she was sitting next uh, to me in school and was going through the same experiences and none of us were friends with each other so in school days um you know there are two sectors to it that's how i believe there's one who's bullying and there's other one who's a victim right and most of so i studied in ryan international school which is like uh, icsc board school and the bullying people they always used to bully because they did not have control at home yes so that anger they used to bring it to school and then they used to bully the other kids like i was one of that person who used to get bullied because i was weak i, w- I could not speak up and every time i used to go to school i used to still think back of my mind is mom or okay at home you know and your studies your school your social status like you don't care about that all you care about is you getting to the class getting good grades being the best person being the first person so that tomorrow your goal is that to take a mom out of that relationship because she does not have that kind of power so today when i talk with my friends who used to believe me they used to say that we were going through the same thing the only way is we did it in a different way we saw a dad doing it and we saw that because our dad was doing it he had the power in the society we became that person even if we did not want it to because that's the environment we used to be in and to personal narrative yes even when i was in school college i was always the weird kid because i used to feel emotions and i still feel emotions so intense that even the funniest conversations people think like why are you taking it so serious you know why are you making it such a big ordeal it's just a joke for me everything is not a joke everything is like so serious like why are you making a fun of somebody else don't do it and that feeling of intense emotions makes me not connect with people from my own age because maybe i'm too mature or i'm too childish So I feel two extreme emotions in every situation and people don't tend to understand that. So in my own personal area I go like okay they will not understand it let's not talk about it. And I end up being a shell of a person. And even relationships like I only tend to believe that there are transaction if that makes sense like your friends are not your real friends they're only there for something. and once that is completed they'll go away so what's the point of creating that intimate relationships you know so yeah that's me uh flavia ma'am i wanted to ask you i mean as children who have experienced this and as and also knowing that we never could at the same time spot somebody else who was going through the same situation uh do you feel it is important for us while we give good touch bad touch education and while we give uh, value systems to uh, students in school do you think it is not important to talk about uh, narratives such as domestic abuse and child sexual abuse also at a very young age for children so that they are sensitized you towards said, other children is it not is it should be they should be yeah the framing of the question yes 
Yeah, I think <coughs> teachers are best situated because they can see the signs in children. Like my son started stammering. He was so overwhelmed with the violence at home that um, once he went to the railway station to buy a ticket, I had already separated, I used to stay far away in Borivli, and they were in Masgaon, and he had to buy the ticket to Borivli. He couldn't utter the words, so he went back, he didn't come at all. So, I mean, the stammering and lacking in confidence was so high. Um, my elder daughter became an achiever. Like, she thought she would be my savior. And she has to do well in everything so that she can rescue me. And the, the last one was, in a way, she saw less of violence, so she was more stable in that situation. But when the teachers see this, in fact, my son had a very good counsellor. And my son used to trust her completely. And anything happens, he used to go and tell her. But not the other. And he used to go to a very good uh, school, St. Mary's, ICSU. So it was very good. And uh, the teachers, the counsellor, everybody was very supportive. Not so for my daughters. And they used to go to uh, schools run by nuns, who, according to me, are most insensitive. They would not want to pick up the signs. In fact, I mean, they would have such rules. Um, like once I had to leave the home and I had to go to my native place, I wanted a school leaving certificate uh, immediately. And uh, after a month, I came back. So I went back to the same school. And they t started telling me, you can't make up your mind once and for all, but they want to go or you want to stay. They wouldn't understand the situation in which you are. So it's very important for teachers to be sensitive, to pick up the signs there's something wrong in his family, and this child needs extra support. Um, whether they're doing good, good in school or not good in school, these things are not linked. Some children do well, some children don't do well, but they're so emotionally disturbed. You can see these signs, and according to me, teachers would be the first to notice, or should be the first to notice. I used to give tuitions at home, and um, when I was still in the violent situation, and you could see the signs in the children, similar to my children. And I knew there was a problem here. And in any time I would say, if you're not doing well, I'll call your father. And they used to literally tremble and say, please don't call my father, because if you tell my father, my mother will get beaten, because it is her failure. Well, Flavia, ma'am, some children are really good at acting, like I was. I always wanted to be an actor at a very young age. Sorry for the joke, but truly. Uh, and so I used to always display this outer version of a very confident person, and no one could actually really see what was happening inside my inner landscape. And I really wished to find uh, friendships where somebody would just notice that I am just putting up this act. So. I do understand that you're saying it is very important for teachers to be sensitized, which is also the step number one, which is not happening right now. But how important is it to bring about this education for students? And at what age should that be? I think it should be inbuilt. How we are now saying good touch, bad touch, um, sexuality, education, etc. I think it should be... See, you're brought up saying all marriages are hanky-dory. You, you get married and live ever, uh, happily ever after. It takes a long time to say, no, this is not it. This is not marriage. Marriage is full of turmoil, so much of emotional uh, 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 upheaval. Uh, firstly, you are uh, you are you're migrating. You are uprooted. Your support system is gone. And then you have to build new support system. And in that, you are so vulnerable. Nobody tells you all these things, you know. And then you get married and you say, my God, whatever I read, whatever I knew, whatever I told is all I like. So I think this myth has to be broken very early for children. And it's only because my daughters knew this, they could make a better choice. That marriages are not all that great, and you have to make them work, and there is a lot of violence in there. That brings me to a question that I wanted to ask you, Ifat. Uh, two siblings going through the same experience, exactly, making completely, absolutely different decisions for their lives based on the experiences they've had. Why does that happen so often? Why is it that two people who are seeing the same things uh, function completely differently? So, so Jata, I mean, it's, um, I think, human nature. No two people react to a situation in the same manner, right? 
So while this, the situation may be common, each person's response or coping mechanism is very different. So what I may interpret out of a situation and what you may in the same, we may be faced with the same thing. So like siblings at home, while one may interpret it as the mother's fault, the other might justify the mother, right? So it's all a matter of how they perceive it. And uh, this is, it's a, it's a very uh, common human characteristic trait, right? So the way each person's response mechanism re uh, reacts to a particular situation is very different. No two people will react to the same situation in exactly the same manner, mm -hmm. right? So you believe what you want to believe. And uh, I think this starts even as kids. Uh, uh, the factor that at what state that child has come yeah, and how the mother is able to cope is also a very important factor. Because uh, you, uh, when the elder child was born, mother must have been more vulnerable. And that vulnerability transfers uh, to the child. But later, the mother is able to cope with it better, able to handle the violence better. So the, that child sees the things in a very different manner and is able to cope with it. Is not so bogged down by it. I can say the gradation with my children, the way I was able to cope with it, for instance. Lakshmi, you want to add to this? Because you have had, you have a sibling, and you've yeah. been you've been the protector for her. But uh, there, I'm I'm sure you have something to add to this. So my sister is quite different to me. I am the diplomatic man, but my sister is the one with anger. And she's the young, sh younger she's one. She's the younger one. So she will not she will not stay quiet. She will say it the way it is. She she pushes people away. She tells my dad. She tells my mom. She tells from friends. She tells the way she feels it. But ours will be the diplomatic one, right? The one who understands people and then says what she needs to say. So growing up, my sister was more confident than I was. She's more proactive. She's more confident in who she is than who I am. So I think she believes in the fact that, okay, I need to have the power. In, in any relationship, I need to be the one instigating it. And that gives me courage. So I might, be, I might have been the protector, like telling her, okay, you know what, put up the headphones, don't listen to what they're saying, focus on her studies. Today she's, a, she's the one who's protecting me. <laughs> it's quite different to what when we were younger. So yeah, I think it is different. It is very different. Uh, let's move on to the more uh, logistical parts of it now, Flavia. Ma and again, I will start with you. Um, so growing up, I continuously told my mother, I will protect you. No matter how young I was, I, w I used to always tell her, I will protect you, you get out of this. But logistically, could you in a very uh, simple way explain, today if a mother decides that she wants to get out of an abusive marriage, what are the exact next steps that she can follow? How much is the state support here? If I want a shelter home that the perpetrator doesn't know about, do I have possibilities for that? And, and how can I avail of that? And what, do, what does the law offer us? Actually, the state and the law offers us very little. Uh, first, you, uh, to take the decision uh, to separate, first of all, you need to have some mechanism of economic survival. Because most of the time, women are trapped because they don't know how to survive outside of this marriage. Marriage may be violent, but still it is a shelter. It's a roof over your head. It is uh, your children are getting their uh, food on the table because of that. And to break that and to make yourself and your children much more vulnerable is very, very difficult. So a lot of women come to me for advice and they say, I just want to know my rights. I don't want to do anything. Um, so that itself is a very important step to come out to understand what my rights are and which way I should move. And I always tell them, find some avenue whichever small avenue that to stand on your feet, to earn your living, never mind how small it is. And I also tell them, you take the first step. That's the most difficult thing. When you take the first step, then other, slowly, slowly, you will be able to uh, take more steps. And before you realize, you, re, you, feel, you, you will know that you have gone very far from the situation of violence. We don't have state support. Our shelter homes are not uh, very good or very bad, in fact. And women, they don't keep women with children. So, and then also you are, um, see for children, the school education is most important. And it's very difficult. In Bombay, the situation is very grim here. 
Uh, so you don't want to leave because of the children's education. You don't want to take them somewhere, cart them somewhere uh, where there's no avenue of good education. So that becomes a primary point. So you, you have to list out which are the areas I need to work on. Find an alternative. I always tell my clients before you leave, you decide where you're going and find out school admission over there. First of all, ensure that you get admission. Don't go when the exams are uh, approaching because uh, then your child will lose a year. So all the small, small little things, you know, that one needs to prepare and nobody tells you that you need to prepare for all these things. You're going to your mother's house, it's in this locality, go to the nearby school, find out from them that will they admit your child and even the courts take it very seriously. Courts will send the child back if the child is not going to school. So, and they don't have this understanding that, you know, you're struggling to like cope with the situation. So these, uh, and our judges think very mechanically, our judges think in a very traditional conservative way. You're disrupting the family, you're ruining the children, and they always think it is uh, a family living together is better for the children. So they always send you back, etc. Unless you have answers to all these questions that you make all your, it's not, and many women come and tell me, so and so happened, so and so happened, it was going on for a long time. One fine day I left. I left without even my clothes, I, I left without my undergarments. I said, why did you leave? You were in this marriage for 10 years, 12 years, whatever. Why did you not prepare that one day I will have to leave? And then play it well. Uh, for every other situation, you uh, think so much, you plan so much. Until leaving, even to getting married. You don't think too much and getting married, you don't think too much at the time of leaving. So you have to work these things out very carefully, step by step. Where will I go? I will go to my mother's house or I'll go to a friend's house or I will save some money so that I can rent a place, whatever. All these things need careful planning. But the state has no support at all. Find a lawyer, find a support network. For me, it was my support network that really helped me. And of course, I've been planning it like for 13 years, I've been in a bad marriage. I've left several times, I've come back several times, and I knew why I came back each time, what was the problem. So much before I left, I started giving these tuitions at home and earning some money at home, staying at home only because I couldn't leave the house. So, uh, and I then by the time I left, I had at least some savings. Of course, the tuitions I could not continue because they were in that residence. But, I, and then I had a support group. I had never worked before. I never worked, I was not educated. Uh, just school leaving education. Fortunately, I could speak English. I was not studied in English medium. I studied in vernacular in Manglo. But I'd worked uh, abroad for some time, so I could speak English. That was my only strong point. From there, I built my life. So this, uh, so women, when they take that first step, when they plan things, it's amazing. How they, how they get transformed. And one thing I notice, when they come, you know, they look so haggard. They always cry in your office all the time. First, first meeting, they always cry. One year, two years later, you can't recognize them. They look so good. They look so glamorous. First thing they do is cut their hair. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I did that and uh, all the people around me do that. I said, why do you cut your hair? Uh, that's a great I idea look, for my next series now. Uh, I, I, I want to look younger and they dress much better, everything. And the transformation and the children do so well in school. Yeah. So anybody who says I stay because of my children, I say that's a lie. Because you, in this situation, your ch child is not happy. Yeah. You leave and then you see how well your child is doing. So there are a lot of myths that are there and we need to break these myths one by one. Yes. But in terms of practical support, you now that you're saying that state is perhaps not providing enough support, how can... Not any support, not enough. It's not <laughs> enough. So how can the civil society and the corporates, coming back to you, Manisha, uh, uh, and it's not a question as much as I am imploring, uh, 
when do you think do you see, foresee in the future there would come a time mm-hmm. that the csr teams of big corporates would actually be funding uh, shelter homes for uh, domestic abuse survivors or uh, when the moment they spot that there mm-hmm. is a domestic abuse survivor within their organization they would actually be literally hand holding and streamlining their uh, next steps for them do you think there would come a time like I that i wish i could say yes i am not so sure uh, i know this is being recorded so i'm being a little careful but you see what has happened today with the csr law and uh, which is a struggle for all companies is there is a certain amount of compliance and um, you know the way th- you know the expectation of the government is to support certain big ticket causes uh fact of the matter is the subject we are talking about today is a big um, ticket cause no not no? for not for society still mm. and that's why sessions like what you're doing today the work that you're doing or g5 a anuradha have put together to me these are really the kind of conversations we need to bring to the mainstream uh that's when it becomes uh, you know something which is worthwhile for a corporate to put their money behind i'll be very transparent about it right so today for me uh, a bnp paribas is supporting this i know some other organizations are but you know if it also is from a corporate background uh, i'm sure she'll share my view that this is not something which is a movement yet absolutely i totally agree and at least i would say uh, multinats are still doing it i don't think the companies that are in in companies don't even look at these issues so what would it take to make it a movement you know i think these are building blocks you know i'll be very uh, honest i started my career about 24 years ago and uh, we never spoke about sexual harassment at work never okay till about 10 years ago nobody was talking about pride okay so it's a journey always i think today that we have something like this and even if uh, the room is not uh, you know bursting at it seems that we might only be 40 people in the room there are 40 people who showed up taken time out of their personal lives and are here today so to me This is a starting step and you you keep on having these conversations hopefully you'll keep them alive through mediums um you know not just physical spaces virtual spaces and we'll see this ball rolling uh, but it'll take time um but i think we're on the right track honestly uh, at least in some corporates we are having initiatives where we bring independent experts like flavia ma'am to come in speak to our people um uh, maybe it's only happening once a year but it's a starting point I think it starts with people like you and me because with Thomas think it was most of the time mums would not be that courageous to come at least if then if they don't have that economic survival if, just how we fly we are mum said but if kids like you and me start coming up and saying that you know what my whole existence comes to a point because of my mum and I want to share my own story if people start to showing their stories I think it becomes a moment like just like me to or pride or anything else that's going on right now so it, it depends upon a person it depends upon young generation i suppose to come up and speak and show that okay you know what this is what i went through this is why i am who i am today so yeah actually uh, 40 years ago it was not seen as an issue at all and that's that's been the journey 20 years ago we got a law uh for uh, articulating that domestic violence exists and women need remedies remedies such as uh, residence that uh, he can't throw you out he can't say this is my house and i'll throw you out for the first time like um, 20 years ago given then that law is not used to that extent then the issue of maintenance child custody all these other things that come with it uh, hopefully with this awareness and maybe with the corporates coming in we can have better shelter homes better remedies uh, for the women to come out and only then more women will talk about it more women will come out of it otherwise uh, if you depend upon state and state laws nothing is going to work there are ngos like us our ngo consistently has worked on this issue from the very beginning but lot of other ngos are beginning to work on this issue they're acknowledging this and they're providing the support so i think it's a journey and gradually we'll get there also uh, you and i on the uh, when we were sitting outside were having this discussion about how child sexual abuse is uh, inherently intertwined with the uh, domestic abuse as well um do you want to just elaborate on it and and uh, and what are the uh, so we also discussed about the fact how there are some civil society uh, uh, pillars who can uh, 
if they spot a sign of child sexual abuse they can uh, bring it to the notice of the authorities uh, could you just just elaborate uh, on this uh, we have a new law 2012 uh, 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 prevention of child sexual abuse which is gender neutral for girls and boys under 18 if there is abuse anybody can report it's mandatory to report if, if whether you are a teacher you are a doctor you are a counselor that uh, when you find when you see that there is sexual abuse and we we started this work of providing shelter uh, providing support to uh, victims of sexual abuse particularly after they filed a case in co uh, in a police station uh, to provide that support uh, step by step to walk the legal journey and mainly for children and when we did that uh, surprisingly um, the sexual abuse at home, the number of cases of sexual abuse at home was equal to the number of cases of sexual abuse outside. And as you know, in our statistics, 90% of the cases of sexual abuse is by people known to you. They're not strangers as we imagine on a dark street, you know, like Nirbhaya case or something like that. That's not common. Common is everyday violence that happens in your neighborhood, in your uh, homes, in your schools. Uh, by people known to you. So now here, uh, and then when we talk to the victims where sexual abuse at home, uh, uh, happens at home, you also realize there's domestic violence. The woman is vulnerable and she's not able to speak because uh, she herself is a victim. And she's in that violent situation. And in that violent uh, situation, the child abuse happens. It has started taking more, se uh, note more seriously because of the child sexual abuse, the domestic violence has come out. Otherwise, it would, wouldn't be taken as something serious. Uh, and in this process, what we do is, um, once the child is in a vulnerable situation, the state has to step in, provide shelter for the child, and take the child out of that situation, and provide a safe place. So that happens more often. And the role we play is that of providing social legal support and uh, being with the child from the time the FIR is filed till the uh, case is uh, goes on to trial and final verdict comes out. And that's a big step because imagine an 8-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old having to stand in the court and facing cross-examination by a very astute lawyer, criminal lawyer, well-versed in law. And this child is put there. Nobody is there to support her. In the sense, she has filed this FIR maybe two years ago. And she doesn't remember exactly what was written out. And maybe the child uh, speaks a different language. And the FIR is written in Marathi. She doesn't even know what is written there. And on that, she'll be cross-examined. And on that, the verdict will come uh, acquitting the accused. So it's not just the acquittal of the accused person, but it is that makes her a liar that she manipulated the system and newspaper reports will come out how the cases are uh, acquitted but this child has filed a false case etc etc so it is a question of her identity it is a question of her uh, um, self-determination whether you should file a case or not according to me i mean this is what i always say and people feel aghast at that i said if you're not going to forgive the support don't do not tell them to go and file the case if you're not going to give them the support just telling this child, oh, sexual abuse happened, go and file the case. I said, don't do that, for the NGOs particularly. I said, be with her and be with her for next two, three years. Not just one day, two day, one month. Like a caseworker. Like, like a caseworker. Uh, NGOs. Yeah, yeah. With, this person has gone to an NGO, a child has gone to an NGO and they have they have sent the child to file the case. Because otherwise there will never be conviction. A conviction rate is as low as about 25%. It's same in UK also. Conviction rate in rape cases is very, very low. So what happens to all the other cases that are filed? Whereas in the work that we do, we have brought it up to 70%. Because we provided that support to say what to say, what is a trial, what is a judge, what's the role of a judge, what is the role of a public prosecutor, what is the role of a defense lawyer, and that accused person is in the court, by the way. And she has to depose in front of him what exactly happened. And imagine having to tell all the minute details about a rape. I mean, normal sexual abuse, you will not be able to speak. Even an adult would not be able to speak. So I tell the people, have you ever faced cross-examination? Have you ever been to court? 
it's like answering an exam without preparing and then you expect the system will work and conviction will happen and if it doesn't happen it was on her the blame is on her so this is an area which is even more uh, critical than uh, the domestic violence because domestic violence you're dealing with women and the women who want to file the case you're not going into somebody's house and said uh, come i'll file the case for you that's not what we do they come and say i want to change my life but here it happens to her is mandatory reporting it is not her wish at all that she would want to be raped or she want to report this is not that it is her wish and then she is put into the system and that is also criminal this is civil domestic violence is a civil case that's a criminal court so you can imagine how daunting it is so that is now our very major work that we do is providing support to children of sexual violence so what are the rights for somebody like me who experienced uh, sexual violence when i was 3 years old but this is now when i am capable enough to file a complaint against the perpetrator what are the rights for somebody like me absolutely no rights because uh, after such a long gap i mean people do file i'm not saying people don't file because that gives them a sort of a closure but don't expect a system to understand it that for 40 years i didn't file now suddenly i got up and i'm filing and i want justice that doesn't happen yeah. what are the kind of challenges you face uh, uh, in i'm very sorry to sound very dismal and uh, pessimistic but that's the reality so i mean in fact i was just going to add to what uh, freedom ma'am said just now uh, we wanted to start working with a school okay and we were asked to set up a cell there uh the first thing that the school authorities mentioned to us is that if there is any reporting for poxo we don't want to be involved right now what is poxo so that same child sexual it's, it's a per protection of uh, okay. children against sexual abuse so they said that if a child comes and reports will you take responsibility for it because the school is not willing to do that right so like she said uh while everybody talks about filing cases nobody wants to give the support through the entire trial right and it's a, it's a long haul right the child is not going to be able to do it on the own uh very often it's some unknown so the family doesn't want to acknowledge it so it's it's a long round battle and if schools put their hands up then there's very little to be said and very often it's the breadwinner that you must keep in mind so the entire family supports the breadwinner so what is what is the role of mental health experts through all of this because the only way somebody like me someone who has experienced abuse of that form will find closure is through having a mental health expert yeah. uh, let so me explain so we that. are mandated to report it so today if we have a child who comes to us to our center and says this is what has happened to us no questions asked we have to report it we don't have an option so that, uh, i mean we have to follow the uh, the eth- ethical code right so psychologists will come to us and we will have to report it uh, but the thing is will the family support it or not is is the bigger question but as a counselor uh, do you uh, advise them on what to do or are you somebody just sitting there and listening to them without judging or without giving any sort of opinion what is the role of a con- counselor in no, this no so we will tell them what they're supposed to do for sure because that's mandatory uh, whether they, they decide to take our uh, opinion into account is entirely up to them we are of course always there to support the child uh, in terms of mental health issues but the legal aspect is something that i mean even today if we go and report it but the parents don't want to follow up with it that report is of no use Right. Another challenge that I hear many of the survivors have told me in terms of uh, reaching out to mental health experts, uh, Ifat, is that uh, not finding the right mental health expert and uh, always feeling that you know you keep going through this cycle of over and over and over again. It's like window shopping, and you are feeling naked every single time that you are revealing your narrative to some stranger. How would your organization sort so of provide that kind of support where? Uh, you know that if i am going to this mental health expert i will truly be treated the way i want to be treated so uh, one thing i'd like to put in perspective sujata is that unfortunately for us in in the indian system uh, today when we go to a doctor we check the doctor's credentials right so you want to know if the doctor is an mbbs or an md how many of us go to a therapist and even ask the therapist if the therapist is qualified right nobody bothers to understand as a you know do they have a masters have have they specialized in clinical psychology are they qualified to, to kind of give therapy in the first place right you have 
fly by night therapists who have mushroomed during covid because people were isolated in homes and then you had suddenly you see ads on instagram and facebook and you know people reach out for as little as 200 300 400 money is not really a problem but i'm saying no one really checks credentials right uh, at our space uh, we ensure that a care is completely holistic i can speak only for ourselves uh, because we have a team of professionals who are completely qualified right so we have highly qualified professionals whether it's our doctors or psychiatrists or the therapists and we work together so we don't work separately so if the child needs help the therapist will speak to a doctor and we will ensure that the child is taken care of but unfortunately this is not followed everywhere especially in uh, shelter homes for example shelter homes uh, will not have they have MSWs which are masters in social work yeah. very often you have MSWs who are attending to these kids now they are not qualified to handle these cases in the first place right they don't have the expertise and which is why you, they feel like i have to bear myself time and time and again because i'm not getting the effective uh, the, the kind of help that i need i mean i live in the uk i can assure you it's worse there even though it's considered first world we actually have only volunteers from civil society who are your first touch point and the longest possible touch point uh, to have conversations with which is why it the mental health is such a big issue in a country like uk so i just want to say something and it's extremely personal and i think i'm sharing it in such an open space for the first time but um i have myself been uh, you know a victim of child uh, sexual abuse and it was not by a family member but somebody who accessed the house um it doesn't go away it stays um i'm in my late 40s now and it was only after uh, some therapy last year that finally i've been able to sort of be okay to talk about it right and my way of finding closure is to actually speak about it very openly to say that it happens to you uh, you're not the one who's brought it upon yourself there's no shame um find ways to, to talk about it i've spoken about it i have two teenagers in the house a boy and a girl i have spoken to them openly about it right um you know my husband is in the audience today i have spoken to him about it there are times when i'm still not able to deal with it and i do talk about it today i'm talking frankly without my voice shaking in a public setting is because it's been you know i think more than 40 years of trying to put these pieces together but i think there comes a time in space and we have to find our own way to to find closure thank you so much manisha for doing this really appreciate that um i think at this point i would ma'am you want to add something I think I'd I'd like to open this up to the audiences at this point if anybody has something to share or would want to ask any question from anyone in the panel or we could just go on with our questions Nobody Great okay so we will uh, I will then move on to the role of art uh in uh, in bringing about change Flavia ma'am you've been around for so long you've worked so uh deeply in this uh, system with this system uh and against this system as well where do you feel art comes in uh to even initiate a conversation i think art has a great role according to me in fact madli started as a, a legal and cultural center and uh, our work influenced the culture center work a great deal um of producing plays producing uh, um uh, tv or uh, or two minute clips on to be aired on tv because our experience gave it nuance uh so what came out uh, in the art form was not just very superficial very nuanced and very deep though it is only two minutes or two and a half minutes etc so according to me in order to communicate to the people the work that you do on the ground needs to be expressed in artistic form and through that you must reach people but do you still think that it uh, it increases the uh, interaction between people who have might not have uh, experienced it and those who are expressing through the form of art do you think uh, art helps to increase that interaction or is it, it still does, very it does. like it does a great deal it does a great deal because you are able to reach to a wider audience through our work we can uh reach only a limited number of people uh, because i write it reaches a greater number but otherwise it's very limited uh reach with the art form i think you will be able to communicate to uh, students to schools to educators to wider audience and i think it is very important to bring in art here 
and and from a CSR point of view, how easy? I mean, I know you've touched upon this, but how uh, how easy do you think going forward in the future these kind of artistic uh, interventions uh, 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 to get funding for these kind of artistic interventions would be? Look, I don't think art. Uh, you know, in a country like India, where uh, philanthropy, mostly corporate philanthropy, is still focused around skilling education, I don't think art is still a very uh, uh, a big pillar. But it's changing. Um, I do see a lot of organizations today wanting to do, but it's still very mainstream. Also, frankly, uh, there's also the other uh, space. There are very few places like G5A, you know, which are truly independent spaces, which are willing to, uh, you know, have these kind of conversations or do this kind of stuff. I, I'm sure, Surata, you yourself, when you are looking for spaces, you'll struggle to find. So yeah, of course, we corporates, I, I, I take responsibility, we're not doing enough. But I think we need more spaces as well, uh, you know, and uh, hopefully there'll come a time. But I do see a shift. I think there is a willingness to want to use art to drive inclusion and discussion on various topics. I mean, I just want to narrate something. I today had a conversation with, a, uh, with an art gallery who reached out to me and said, uh, we'd love to sell your art. And when I started narrating to them about what's the backstory behind every uh, piece, uh, the person became quiet for just a split second and then he said uh, well firstly the stories are so difficult so I don't think anyone would really want to put something like this on their walls but even if they do they would not like to pay too much for it uh, so yeah there we go that is that is where we as artists are uh, placed right now um, what do you think uh, if a uh, how can we integrate art into mental health uh, spaces uh, to help uh, survivors so actually, art-based therapy, ABT, is used a lot with kids, right? And art is a great medium to express. Uh, in fact, uh, 20 years ago, when my daughter was diagnosed with uh, multiple issues, uh, I used uh, ceramics with her. Like That was the only thing that used to calm her down in those days. And uh, art therapists also use art-based therapy. Uh, art is a universal medium, right? You don't. There's no language barrier. That's the best thing, right? And especially when you're working with kids, right, uh, to break the ice, right? You don't need to ask them too many questions. You give them paper, you give them a little bit of material, and, and you'll see that they, they get comfortable really fast. So art, uh, ABT has a lot of potential, and uh, we definitely encourage it. Uh, it's also very calming, right? So like, like I said, uh, with my own daughter, she's sitting in the audience right now, but I'm saying art has played a huge role in her, her life, right? Um, she has also had art exhibitions where she's expressed art, and uh, it's an expressive medium. Right, so you can express anything through art. Yeah. So I feel it's it's very very effective. Now, uh, in terms of expression, uh, one of the challenges survivors face is their first uh, public disclosure of their private reality. Uh, Flavia, ma'am, through your experience, what do you think? What are the first places that a woman, a survivor, goes to to disclose what's happening in her life? What are those first touch points uh, outside of her? Uh, a core uh, perpetrator unit? It's a peer group or mm. support group, maybe an NGO that she goes to. Uh, I think that's the biggest barrier, actually. Uh, now there are spaces are opening up, but not many of them. And it takes a long time for a person to open up to it. Uh, and usually, you know, another interesting point is when somebody comes to ask for advice, they always ask for advice for somebody else. Mm. You know, I know of a person who is doing this. My neighbor is happening. This my sister is happening. It's never me. They don't say I. Uh, I've also done that. That you know, I know somebody who's going through this. What should you do, do etc. Because it's very difficult to own up. Uh, so there you get information which will empower you, where you can strategize and then take the step. Uh, so um, these are the spaces that. I wish we can open up more where the woman can say I rather than somebody else. I think that's the first step that we need to work on that it happened to me. It's the same with the rape survivors. It's always the other that it happened to her. Where did you find your... I'd like to add to that actually, Sujata. I mean, like Flavia said that uh, support groups. I just feel if each one of us is a little more sensitive, very often it just needs that one person. One person, I agree. You just need that one person who you can open up to and that can actually empower you so i think if each one of us keeps our eyes open and our hearts open i think there's a lot of change that we can bring about i agree with you completely like it was for me not support group or something it is few individuals would change my life otherwise my life would have gone on like that 
I was on the lookout, but I was not getting that support through the church groups and through various other neighborhoods everywhere. Uh, people don't want to interfere in family affairs. They want to keep away. So if you can find one person that will stand with you, I think that uh, will change the person's life. So how many of us are ready to do that? I think that's the first, you are absolutely right, that's the first thing that you have to do, that I will support at least one person in my life. Chakshu, where did you find your first touch point where you uh, were feeling, where you were you were comfortable about talking your, uh, about your personal... She said her mother, no, she already said it was for my mother. Her? Uh, mom, yes, because she it was going with her, but it took me 8,000 kilometers away and flying off to another country to start speaking. It was my ex-organization that I worked at, British Library, which is like a civil servant organization, and there were 150 people that I was working there. And um, I was sad one day, and when all of my workers were like, what's happening with you? Because I'm outgoing and I'm socialite, and I would say hi, hello to everybody. And then I said, you know what, I got? I just got this call from my uh, sister and this is what has happened. And they were like, okay, do you want to tell us the whole story? Like, so every worker that, or every colleague I was working with wanted to know what, what what's my backstory. And that gave me courage to be able to say, because one, I was not, it was like, okay, if I share here some today, it's not gonna go back to India. It's not. It's not hampering my family. I am a no one here, like nobody knows me or nobody knows my parents here. So I can openly say uh, my story uh, because of that societal norms and pressure. So I think that was my t touch point going to Western country and finding people who would listen to my story. Do you feel UK's uh, 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 people living in the UK are more open and more receptive to these conversations than people in India? Yes, because it's a very open culture there. I mean, Comparatively to to India, like women are very open to what they are, sh what they feel, what they're sharing, what they're speaking. They're open to talking about what are they eating at home, how they're feeling, to dating, to domestic violence. Whereas in India, I think Indian women are somehow again coming to the first answer that I said, somehow ingrained in their brain that their home is their responsibility, the kids is their responsibility. So. Yeah, we are, we are ingrained in our brains, you know, like, okay, don't speak about it. Whereas in Western countries, they're okay. They just talk. They don't care about what others are, percept others are perceiving them as. And in Indian, we are so much ingrained in perception, like, log kya kahenge? That's true. That's true. And this log kya kahenge concept I hear very often when I am, you know, people are interacting with the works uh, that are here exhibited today. I've always uh, had uh, ma'am uh, people come and tell me, oh, ye inke saath hota hoga, hamare saath nahi hota. Achha, mujhe yaha pe bhoot saare hijab nazar a rahe hain. Achha, are they not from this country? Uh, or are they from this country? When I go to the West, they tell me, oh, thank you so much for showing us a peek into your Indian yeah, culture. Yeah. So uh, how is it that we, as humanity in general, are so quick to other narratives of abuse and say, mere saath nahi hota? Hamare mein nahi hota. <laughs> why, why do you think that's the case? And, and what can be done about that? And uh, Anybody in the panel? No, I, I genuinely feel, I don't, I think it's always uh, comforting to know that it's not happening to you, but it's happening to someone else. But is that true? Right. It's not true, but the thing is it starts with acceptance, right? Only if I accept that it's happening to me, can I do something about it? I think what lacks in the Indian narrative for sure is acceptance, right? And, and, and I mean, uh, while domestic violence is a very serious issue, but even in general, in general situations, right? You don't want to accept that something wrong can happen to you. It can happen to your neighbor, it can happen to the person walking on the street, but it's not going to happen to you. It's ne it'll never happen to me, you know? Yeah. So I think that's the most common narrative that runs across the board here. I think the first thing that we need to start with is learning to accept. Yeah. Right. And maybe creating spaces which are non-judgmental, which is what, I mean, my entire, uh, or rather our, my team, and we, we I mean, you know, the, the space that we've created, that's what you need, right? You need more spaces where people can come and speak and not be judged. Because I think that's what stops people from opening up, the fear of being judged. Yeah. I want to share this experience. Uh, after the Delhi rapist, Nirbhaya case, etc., 
a lot of the colleges and would invite me uh, to give a talk on rape and rape law and what should be doing. But one thing you realize is nobody talks about rape as something that could happen to me or to my daughter. Nobody would tell if it is a rape, what will you do if there is rape? They'll talk in veiled terms like don't come back home late, something will happen to you uh, or do this, something will happen to you. So what is that something? Nobody spells out. So this was an elite college and I spoke to him and I said, let me give you five minutes to imagine if it happened to you, what will you do? And they were so shocked. They could not even fathom that it can happen to, to me. And I said, this girl, uh, this Delhi rapist, she also must have thought the same thing. That when it happens, what to do? How to, if you know it is imminent, then how to safeguard yourself? What should you be doing? What should you not be doing, for instance? How will you protect yourself? Uh, at that instant of the rape, those five minutes, crucial five minutes or whatever, and nobody wants to think about it. And there are many uh, students of that college whom I meet later, and they tell me, ma'am, you don't know how you shook us up. You don't know what uh, transformation we went through in that five minutes when you made us think. And this is what happens all the time. It's always happening to others. Don't talk about it. Don't face it. And it's the same thing for domestic violence. Everybody knows there's domestic violence. Everybody knows you have to get married. But nobody wants you or prepares you that if there is domestic violence, what should you be doing? Where should you be going? What happens to you? How much you should endure? How much you should not endure? And then you have this narrative of a very glorious marriage in India, particularly. And then you have a case of dowry death, wife burning. We give them all kinds of names. It's just domestic violence. And this girl cannot cope. And within two years of marriage, within three years of marriage, some leaving behind infants, small children, pregnant, and they burn themselves. So how? What's the extreme that you go through? One is this whole narrative of a marriage and then the bur burnt body. It's so gruesome, it's so gruesome. Then we have laws on that and something else, something else. But you're not saying there's everyday violence in the marriage, inherent in this marriage relationship of power structure. We're never able to accept that. It really is a power structure, that's it, or nothing else. It's, it's not about the physical part or the you know tangible and intangible parts of it. It's the power. Uh, Ma'am, one of the survivors I met today as, uh, uh, as somebody who was visiting uh, the exhibition and she told me she found a lot of help from Majlis and uh, a very pertinent question she came up with and maybe she wouldn't ask uh, right now while she would be sitting here but on her behalf, uh, even after being divorced, uh, she's having to carry her husband's surname. Why is it that the state, the law is not making it so streamlined that the moment you separate from your partner, it is just implicit that you don't have to carry that person's name? Why do you have to again, after having crossed through miles and miles of trauma, yet again pass on to uh, move on to the other one uh, and and you know try and fight back for your own identity? I just want to share uh, my personal experience here. I'm never, I was never divorced at all. I just stayed separately. I filed a case for, because as a Christian, there was no divorce at that time. And uh, I filed for judicial separation. It was not giving me anything. Sometimes, and it was causing me so much torture. So I would do the case. And I just was living separately. At some point, I decided uh, regarding the passport issue, my surname was there. And uh, I had to go abroad. And then my husband said, I can even stop you at the airport. Uh, because your, your passport is carrying my name. I say, oh, is that it? Yeah, I'll change my name. My passport will not carry your name. So first thing I did was change my name. And then I changed my passport. So Agnes is my mother's first name. So like many Christians ask me, how you got two first names? So in this context, what I want to say, you can change your name at any point. You don't have to change your husband's uh, name after marriage either. Nobody is telling you, it's not, the law doesn't say so, it's not mandatory. It is cultural. It's culture, it's tradition, and you want to be known by your husband's name. I know a lot of friends who have not changed their names after marriage. They're still known by their maiden name only. And many actresses, famous people, they don't change their name after marriage at all. 
शिल्पा शेट्टी और सनी मिश शेट्टी शॉप टू मैरिज इज नॉट चेंज टू नेम आई नो लॉर्ड ऑफ दिस फेमस एक्ट्रेस बिकॉज देर आइडेंटिटी इज ऑलरेडी फॉर्म्ड इज वन योर आइडेंटिटी इज नॉट फॉर्म्ड यू टेक ऑन योर हजबेंड्स आइडेंटिटी सो द सेम वे आफ्टर डिवोर्स यू कैन गो बैक टू योर द लॉ डजेंट से एनी थिंग अबाउट नेम चेंज यू कैन चेंज योर नेम एंड स्टार्ट कॉलिंग योर सेल्फ विद योर मेडम नेम मोर ऑफन दैन नॉट वीमेन हु I okay. changed officially, but you did not change officially. Also, no, I'm I'm not going to generalize here. Let me rephrase the question. Several times it happens that somebody who is in an abusive relationship also comes from a lived experience of uh, it's generational uh, a cycle of abuse, right? Uh, so maybe mm. the woman who has now chosen to get out of a abusive marriage realizes that she cannot, she does not even want to go back to the maiden name because that is where. the footprints of abuse started exactly so how then does the can she then choose to have just like a third surname and yeah, how recently there was this case uh, of uh, a caste in prison supreme court gave a uh, um, guideline that you sh- your occupations in the prison would be according to your caste um upper caste people would be given uh, cooking jobs and lower caste people will be given cleaning the toilets etc so the supreme court uh, says Take it out and all. That journalist is Sukanya Shanta. After discussing with me that I have taken my mother's name, she has she took out the name Shanta. So she for second all the uh, maiden name, uh, I mean all the family name, everything, caste name because your family name is also your caste name in that sense. So there is no. So she said, can I also change? Lot of my uh, clients also ask me, at what stage can I change my name? I said, you can change your name tomorrow. and they feel so empowered with this knowledge and they go and get their names changed officially also so there is no binding Ab- anybody can change the name at any point and they don't need to go back to their maiden name they Not can pick up any, any other, name. other name that's exciting so i can I, pick up I, i'd like to just add here actually when my daughter was 8 years old and my father passed away uh, my husband had also left us at around the same time i think the next day she went to school and she changed her name to my dad's name Right, so oh. I got a call from school saying Inja is insisting that uh, she doesn't want to be called <laughs> Inja Mirza anymore. She wants to take her Nana's. I mean, it, she wants to be a Jeevan again. So she n- changed her name to Inja Heather Jeevan and she took my father's name. I mean, if an eight-year-old can do it, I'm sure anyone can do it, right? Absolutely. And Flavia's granddaughter has taken Flavia's name, so her granddaughter's name is Sara Flavia. I mean, she's taken her name. So I don't think there's anything stopping any of us from taking whatever name we want. And Zara Flavia sounds like such a strange mixture. Uh, not only the two women name, but also two religiously uh, significant uh, names. So you can change your name any time. Any anybody can change. Men also can change their names if they want, but they don't want to. Ah, uh, because that's a family name, and also this changing name is only a gender question. It's a women's question. But they are constantly changing from here to there. Their identity gets changed. Their names get changed, etc. So women are always bogged down by this question. That what name should I take? What name should I take? And it's very interesting that my clients, as soon as they file for divorce, they say, "Ma'am, when can I change my name?" That's because, ma'am, I think men are born with knowing what their identity yeah. is, but women, for all of their life till the time they die, are seeking for their identity. Identity is very fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would at this point, uh, I know I'm directing this question to you, Preeti and Vikram. They are two of my previous uh, bosses. Uh, they are sitting in the uh, audience today, and I'd I'd really like to ask this question if it's okay with you. Uh, they are both uh, previous uh, journalists. Vikram is currently practicing journalist, and uh, Preeti is working in the social services sector. Uh, many a times, these stories come up, Nirbhaya, or what recently happened in Calcutta. Uh, uh, how is it that our news channels and our popular media is just making it into a sunsunny case khabar and actually not Sensitized enough to really channel this conversation in a in a proper manner. What wh- what do you what do you think? Why is this happening? Is it is it because we are waiting? For, we are only focusing on TRPs, and and we are we are an extremely inherently insensitized s- society, or or is effort being made? I'm so sorry to have put you guys in the spot, but I'd really like to ask. Uh, Vikram, if it's okay for you to take the mic. Yes, sir. So. through the conversation i've been wondering whether there is a hierarchy of violence that uh, gets reported that gets talked Absolutely, about yeah. yeah there it seems to be that because when you talk about uh, child sexual abuse suddenly there is a flavor to for the lack of a better term 
a flavor of a season and we kind of go after those stories. We are discussing that at the workplace as well. Why certain stories become the flavor of the season. So if uh, we are talking about bomb threats suddenly, then everyone is going after that. And it doesn't matter whether it's a business news channel or a general news channel, everyone wants to talk about the same kind of stories. And it certainly seems that way that we are picking out stories. Sensationalism sells in whatever space that you're in. And news should be pare isse, but it doesn't happen. Unfortunately, we have to handpick stories. There is only a certain news cycle, and we know that the attention span of a viewer is only like two minutes max. We have to catch his or her attention. And how we pick stories is definitely going to be based on that. I don't see that changing, unfortunately. And the long format, because people don't have patience, is going away, right? So you need to explain these stories. Where is the space to explain these stories when we are just trying to pack, what, what's it called, 100 minutes, 100 news items? So we're just scratching the surface for just about everything. And that's sad. Did right? you want to add to it? No, uh, I mean, there is. I mean, you move from I news to social uh, And that sector. is one of the reasons that I did. But, um, you know, there's sort of uh, a question brewing which I wanted to ask the panelists. Uh, um, first of all, I just think there's so much gumption over here. There's so much courage that I just want to thank you all for sharing, uh, you know, what you've uh, shared today and, you know, your thoughts. But, um, you know, I. As someone who got recently introdu introduced to restorative justice as opposed to criminal justice in the, you know, I work with the CNCP system, the Children in Need of Care and Protection, I was just uh, wondering whether there are any cases where the perpetrator has been worked upon and um, has transformed. Um, I mean, of course, uh, you know, it's great to hear when uh, the victims have transformed and, you know, changed their lives. But have, have you ever witnessed something like that, ma'am? We don't work in that area because we have limited resources. And with great difficulty, we do this much work. We can't do anything more than that. Uh, but uh, um, there are people who are working with uh, uh, abusers, uh, and uh, they only do that work. And I'm sure they must have, have found some change. Um, but also, um, in terms of restorative justice, our criminal law sees penal punishment uh, and uh, incarceration as a solution. And then, of course, going on to death penalty. I don't subscribe to death penalty, even in the rarest of the rare cases. Uh, but uh, incarceration, yes. So like, and our whole campaign for law reform has uh, geared around minimum punishment, seven years minimum punishment, 10 years minimum punishment, etc., as a deterrent. I don't, again, believe that is a deterrent. And judges give whatever they want, two months, three months, six months, one year, and all that. But uh, that's the only way we see the system, that this person must be put away, and then society will be transformed. And I don't think women's movement has found an answer to that. Because um, even if somebody comes out of seven years or ten years or something on bail or even acquitted or whatever, there's such a hue and cry against it uh, that that person should be put away for life. So we never think of like, can that person be transformed? Can that person become a better person? But we always think that put this person away and society will be improved. That's the way the mindset is formed. And it also puts the person, uh, the uh, victim, at a higher risk if the perpetrator uh, comes, out. comes back. Yeah. Mm. Can I just add to that? You know, uh, I won't speak on the justice system, but I'll speak about society culturally. I think one of the things we're always in a hurry to do is to restore the status of the perpetrator, to being this ideal person. So, uh, to me, that's a bigger problem actually. You know, because a lot of this, what happens in terms of abuse, happens with people who have access to us. They're in our homes. They're around us. And we somehow, after we are done with that acute incident, we want to restore their place in our families. I think to me, that's a larger problem, actually. <laughs> I don't know, I mean. Uh, Absolutely. Um, uh, my god, I'm so uh, deeply into this that I also <laughs> have forgotten the question that I was going to ask next. Uh, it was about the deterrent. You said so 
this punishment that punishment and definitely that sentence is not a deterrent so what do you really think could be a deterrent eventually no i uh, don't believe in death penalty but i do believe in a uh, deterrent punishment uh, i do believe in the punishment system because our minds are set in that manner we have been like geared towards that uh, even in domestic violence cases and even in my case um people ask me has he transformed has he become a better person i said that's not my concern if he's a better person better for him what role do i have to play anyway i am separated i am an individual by myself now and uh, that is and i've got 100 problems on my hand so that's not one of my problems on my plate if he's become better for me person well and good i'm happy for him that he's a better person everybody should be a better person that means doesn't mean that i'm go around like transforming the whole world to become better persons i have only very limited role <laughs> have you if at uh, i don't want to play act god and say <laughs> the whole society should be redeemed and become better i agree i am a limited person i have limited resources i do limited kind of work and i am very sure about it i have always been very sure similarly for domestic violence victim you know ma'am this woman she's beaten i said ask her to come talk to me no she doesn't want to come i said then i can't play god knock on the door and say who oh, you are being beaten i'm a lawyer i can help you that's not my role i have to define my role and constrain myself within that i cannot go beyond that and i'm very clear from the very beginning i was very clear that's a brilliant point huh? uh, people often ask me as an artist do you not feel helpless that you cannot help these women and and all you can do is take photos and it's it's a great way to articulate that that i have actually really defined what yeah, what like, i can do yeah. and i will i will make sure that i do it to the best of my ability exactly uh if at have you uh, taking forward from uh, preeti's question have you have you or the organization had at all uh, had perpetrators come over and say that we want to uh, change no not not till now we've not we've had a lot of victims no perpetrators at all that's quite an incredible answer do you help <laughs> them if they come um why not okay. i mean you need to give everyone a chance at least i feel that way but uh, i mean there's no saying which way that may go it's true uh let's start then by defining roles that we can play because we are it seems like we are ending the conversation today at a cliffhanger almost where it just is uh, all doom and gloom and it seems like we really can't do anything about it manisha what do you we think we can do, do a lot of things we have discussed so many things we can do i mean we this uh, is the one <laughs> point we said we can't do but all the other things we can do yeah i mean on an individual level on a civil society level there are a lot of things we can do because there really is no state support from the corporate sector going forward what do you think can be done within the confines within the uh, limits that uh, even the csr teams have what do you I think, think can be done we continue to do what we're doing we uh, try to push boundaries of conversation uh, we create spaces and uh, people like me who have the opportunity who have a voice we raise the voices we bring things into public domain that's what i would do i would say that's the only way to go uh, chakshu what would you think as a no, as a survivor yourself what is your and my role in uh, in normalizing these conversations even on the smallest of level i think trying to i think social media is a great medium to start off with uh and corporates and people like gfa if they come in inside and they give us that kind of support and safety and if people start speaking if you know what this conversation i was having which she was uh which is an NGO in UK and I was like I had this brilliant idea like if we could have NGOs or open spaces who create these groups for people who are domestic abuser uh, victims abusers kids and if they can have this open dialogue conversation around without any judgment and somebody starts speaking and then there's other person coming just like how alcohol uh people get that kind of support right if we get that kind of support i think it becomes a progressive society and people start talking about it and that is something i really want to do like as a person i want if you if i can start sharing my story and if people can come and if we become a group band let's do it let's change the society happy to be on board you can please use our resources we'd be more than happy to help you do that <laughs> I definitely want to help. You got your next idea for your entrepreneurial project. 
<laughs> I really, really want to do that. This is something I've been wanting to do since I was a kid. So yeah. Brilliant. Any anything? Any last uh, words that anybody on the panel want to share? Any anecdotes? Any? I I I generally so jata. I mean, I just like to end on this note that if you can be there for just one person, I mean, you know, I think that truly makes a difference, right? While we all talk about big movements, those happen when they happen. But what can you do in the now is what matters the most, right? So how can you help the person right next to you by being there? I think that's the most important narrative for me, at least, right? Because I told you my story and how I set up the whole space. So I mean, all of us think about big things, and we all want to be part of larger movements. But how do you start with something, even if it's the smallest thing? Like, so I think that's important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Anybody, please. Uh, we'll have to pass on the mic to you. Thank you so much for all the discussion. Uh, I would uh, the last question that you were saying, how we can that is definitely one we should be go doing like one person that we can help. But I would uh, I think sometimes that if the popular medium, especially in India, film is a very 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 popular medium to tell a story, to you know kind of brainwash our. Uh, what we think, how we think, like uh, so far the economic uh, the, this thing ideas have been there have been a kind of um, like uh, rich people marrying uh, a good uh, poor man or poor woman. That kind of social uh, distance had been uh, kind of uh, penetrated in our head. That look at the person as a person not uh, with the economic background similarly if these kind of stories are told in a popular medium even tv serials and all nonsense stories are there most of the time <laughs> in indian so why not having popular popular way i'm not saying in a artistic way where elite has only kind of understanding but like how three idiots access the you know very in a kind of very popular way of storytelling it was not a art film where pe people would not have related on hardly ma few people would have seen if the popular stories are told about women you know so maybe that can help i That's think that is actually starting i don't know if you guys are aware about the new movie with Blake Lively ends with us that yeah, but the, i was telling the simple yeah. hindi hindi movies which are very common common yeah. people stories yeah. good stories are there i and there are there where we access those kind yeah. of things yeah. where you know general people are go, mm. going for movies as fun thing it can be made fun also the stories can be twisted where people entertain yet you learn something like a darlings that alia bhat did yeah if so i think you need to tell alia to do more such stories <laughs> <laughs> sure, thank sure, you alia. so much <laughs> uh, uh just i i'm so sorry before ending this i uh, and i'm so sorry to be putting another audience member on the spotlight here but uh, we have archana panya here who's a very famous radio presenter and uh, archana since we are talking about popular media you have immense power in your hand you know you're uh, one of the most famous radio jockeys in the country how would you how do you think you have a role to play in actually you know really making it a cool discussion i mean we are talking about ivf and we are talking about neurodiversity and it has actually become a very very trendy conversation how do we make conversations around domestic abuse trendy for the lack of a better word and what is your role to play in it how, how does a dv it survivor come to you and t tells a story with great pride and just you know I think yeah. you know the sad part about radio right now is we don't do as much CSR on it which would be of this gravitas but I do feel that when I talk about them empower them on the other side like say that they make so much difference when you are celebrating everything that they bring to the table on an everyday basis and make them feel valued on those basis you see what happens is it's exactly what lapata ladies did when she was complimented for the food she cooked it broke my heart into million pieces ki 
अच्छा ऐसे भी होता है खाना अच्छा होता है हटो ये कौन बोलता है यू नो द इशू इज दैट वी डोंट अप्रीशिएट वॉट दे डू इट्स टेकन फॉर ग्रांटेड फॉर सेंचुरीज एंड आई थिंक माई जॉब एज एज अ वुमन प्रजेंटर has been not just to make them feel special every time they call me but they go back with a smile of saying you know what i'm going to be happier today i'm going to live a better life today having said that just as recently as the navratras because you know kolkata shook us all and that's exactly what i shared with you when you came on the show as well i i thought it was my duty to say they're not just goddesses to pray to but they are people that we need to bring to the fore who are actually helping them and that's when i had a very beautiful lady of 85 who's been doing this she was a dean of science hospital and she told us stories of um, men who were perpetrators who got uh, exactly what you all were talking about got converted and they actually started helping other women and men to come on that side so it i think my job is to say positive stories but while i may be highlighting the grim being a girl and being a woman just being that beacon of light and i'm so grateful that you said you know bring that one person change into that one person's life for me i think the dialogue would be pretty much like that would be the three idiots route would be like i use entertainment spit a line and will leave you know it because subconsciously radio works brilliantly having said that i haven't thought over what you just asked me it's it's a very deep question i have to go back to the drawing board of how radio works and how we can do this on a regular basis but for me if i had the opportunity which i did to interview a sudha murthy to interview a fade souza i will not stop and that's where i want my liberating stories and that's where i also want the so called educated and extremely uh, you know uh, people who so called think they're liberals to get their stories from and she said she was 24 afi uh, and she said my mother let me go and travel europe and i just realized i have wings and i think we forget that these small acts can make women while i know that seems elitist but there are small acts amongst all of these people who highlight what the others can do irrespective of social economics i'm um, incredibly grateful to all the panelists i cannot believe i think we have had a very deep conversation and i have managed to remember all the questions i wanted to ask thank you so much g5a